Okay, so let's start. It's usual in the morning, a bit slowly because it's 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 always hard for everybody, also for the speaker. And let me remind you what we 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 were doing. So the aim of the class was to analyze somehow the singular behavior of minimal surfaces in higher codimension. And the picture we we had in mind, starting from an example, was the one of a complex variety with a branch point. And this one is what is called branch points. OK, and the idea was, OK, we don't know uh, how to treat these, uh, these singularities. The criterion for the uh, decay of the excess is not working. Let's try to build immediately a parametric, a, a non-parametric theory out of this uh, picture. So considering uh, a, a multiple value function, which is described this, uh, this manifold there. And um, OK, let me say, because I mean, I'm, I'm a bit uh, late with the program of the notes. So I won't arrive to, to discuss much about the nonlinear case of minimal surfaces. <coughs> But let me say that this one is not really the general case. Or at least, I mean, we don't know if every minimal surfaces can be locally parameterized by such a multiple values function. But at least this one is an example. And at least this one is a case we have to consider. And actually, this, uh, this non-parametric theory may be applied via an approximation result, which allows us to pass from a general current to a multiple value graph. So, but nevertheless, let's consider this as a first step. Because anyhow, it's a first step in the, in the theory. Um, and what we have done yesterday was to formalize this notion of multiple value function. So we consider this space of two points, AQ of Rn. And then we consider function from a domain in Rm to U to AQ. And for this function, we tried to develop the first order calculus. So what is a differential? A, what is a, a Sobole function? So on and so forth. And the idea is, OK, in the end, we would like to analyze a function which has a first derivative inside for this object. So we need to define this, this first derivative. Now, as for, for codimension one, the linearized equation is the Laplace equation for this object. So why don't start considering the Dirichlet energy? And that's what we did at the end of, uh, of the class yesterday. So we consider minimizers of such an energy. And I, and I can tell you that, of course, this one is not really the, the general case. I mean, here we should put the area function to to reconstruct in kind of pointwise way the, the mass of the current. But nevertheless, the proof of the theorem for minimal currents is not, is not even passing from the area function here. But it's passing via the, the, the linearized equation. So considering this case is kind of a meaningful case in the theory. So that's why, I mean, it's, it's much simpler. Now we will see it, and I will comment in which steps this, this function is kind of more elementary. But nevertheless, it, it has all the features and all the issues that you, you will find in the general theory. So let's, let's consider this. And, and what we did yesterday was to argue vaguely about the existence, which, you, which, which was obtained via the direct method. in the calculus of variation. <coughs> OK, from, from today on, we will discuss about regularity. And regularity of, so first of all, of minimizers of this, of this function. So now the theme is, once we've settled all the, all the terminology, the notation for this case, now we come back to the main theme of the course, which is the regularity.
And as I told you yesterday, a first regularity result is uh, investigating how regular are these multiple valued harmonic functions. And I told you the best we can obtain is, uh, is uh, an older continuity result. So this one is the theorem. So every de-minimizing. So this one is, uh, is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the technical name for this, uh, for the minimizer of, of the Dirichlet energy. And they are not called harmonic, but you have to think they, they play the analogous role of the harmonic function. But they are not called harmonic because in this context there is a difference between minimizers of the Dirichlet energy and solution of a generalized Laplace equation. So that's why, I mean, we are talking just about minimizers. So every d minimizing function u, so from in W, in W12 omega aq is older continuous in the interior. So in the interior means in every open set compactly supported in omega. With an exponent which is which is just dimensional, it does not depend on on the set. So exponent alpha, which depends on the dimension m and q, bigger than zero. And actually, when m is uh, is two, we know exactly the value of this exponent. So alpha of two q is one over q. Okay, but this one we won't see the proof. So let me first give some argument for this result. And I told you this result is kind of optimal. So if, uh, so yesterday I just uh, said that, I mean, if we consider these branch points in uh, complex varieties, they also represent graph of their minimizing functions. So in particular, we may somehow choose the wrong plane how to parameterize this function. And for example, taking the variety, which is uh, here, it's a, a z squared equal, equal w, and parameterize in the, in the wrong way, because this one would be a very nice curve if you see with respect to the, to the z-plane. But with respect to the w-plane, it looks like this. And this one is an example of uh, a de-minimizing two values functions. And indeed, this one is the square root of z, which is one, uh, which is one half older continuous. So this result is optimal, and, and we don't have anything more about this, this continuity. which is a big difference with respect to the codimension one case. Harmonic function, the codimension one case were analytic. Here, the best we have is just continuous, uniformly continuous. Okay, so let's now understand the, the, this result. So the surface is not singular because it's yes, but if you write z in terms of w, this is not uniquely determined. Um, well, I mean, it's a, so the graph is two-dimensional of a space which is four-dimensional. So, I mean, I agree, it's a, this graph is kind of misleading. And the idea of this graph is that if you parameterize with respect to, to W, for each W you find two 
determination of the of the square root. So above each point here in the W plane, you find two of, of such points. So that's the only meaning of this graph. But I mean, I agree, it's it's quite misleading because that 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 point is not a singular point if you look at the surface, because this surface is going around here, but actually it's a, an immer a, an embedded surface there. So that's just a problem of the parametrization. But the, the statement is that every every parametrization of a complex variety gives rise to an example of de-minimizing function. So even if we choose the wrong parametrization, that one is a de-minimizing function. And, and this de-minimizing function is a, is a older continuous with exponent one half. But I agree the picture is kind of misleading because this one is not a singular point as this one even if the picture is just a rotation of this. Okay, is it clear? Come on. I mean, you may, you may complicate here a bit more the, the equation to make this, uh, this singular, anyhow. And uh, it's still the same picture. Okay, but let's argue a bit about this, uh, this continuity results, because it shows you, in, in some way, uh, uh, the fact that uh, these uh, functions are taking values in this space, which is a you know, singular space, but we have settled all the instruments in order to really work as, as if we had values in a end. So to apply instruments in, a, in the usual analysis uh, uh, of partial differential equation. And this one is an example where we see how such instruments can be employed. And indeed, the proof is, um, is made of two steps, uh, and the first step is a uh, is uh, a proposition, which is the core of the proof. But and, and the proposition is this: so so we assume that uh, f. In W12, let's say of a ball, BR into AQ of R n is the minimizing. And we assume also that the, the trace of F, which in principle is just an L2 function, is W12. So G, which is the trace of BR belongs W12 of the boundary of BR, the space of two points. Then we conclude that we have a differential inequality between the energy of F and the energy of the trace. And the inequality is that the, the integral on BR of DF squared is less or equal than a dimensional constant, the integral so R times the integral of the boundary of BR of DG, of DG squared. And the dimensional constant is, uh, so for M is, is less than one over M minus two, and when M is equal to two, we have actually a, a explicit. explicit value. So what I'm saying is that every time I have a de-minimizing function, and I select a slice, BR, in which my function is still still W12, which is basically almost all, uh, all the slices, then I have such an inequality here, which, is, which I call the differential inequalities, because this quantity here is, um, resembles very much the derivative of this, of this quantity here with respect to R. So this one is kind of, of, of geometric proposition that I mean we will, we will see in a while. And now uh, I will show you very briefly how, uh, how this proposition, applying just kind of common instrument in analysis, gives the, the, the conclusion of the older continuity.
So here it's a kind of sketch of, of the proof of the theorem, assuming the proposition. So and this one is really, it's really a classical result. I will just go very, very quickly on this. So for convenience, we call gamma of, of m the difference between uh, the inverse of this constant and uh, m minus two. And we set h of r this function, which is the, the energy in Br of, of our, our de-minimizing. OK, now it's very simple to see that this function, as a function of r, is absolutely continuous. Because it's an integral of an L2 function on, uh, on this domain. And so. It's derivative. It's almost everywhere given by the integral on the slice of, uh, of this energy. Just argue via a quaria argument or, or even just looking the, the different ratio of this, uh, uh, of this quantity. And now this one is the full gradient, which of course is bigger or equal than if I just take the tangential derivative. And this one is the energy of a function which is defined on the spheres. So I'm just looking at the tangential derivative of, of f, which are of course less than the total derivative. So here I put the total derivative of the trace. Okay. Okay, so now we just use this inequality here. So let me write here. What we have is that, so, so this one we can read as h of r. So now we apply the proposition is h of r is, is less or equal than uh, uh, so c which now I take from here, it's, a, it's one over gamma plus m minus two. And then I have r, and instead of the integral of dg squared, I put the derivative of r. And now it's clear the terminology of differential inequalities. So now I have my function, less or equal than r, it's derivatives times this constant. And this one is an inequality I can uh, integrate. So what I have here, integrated in this inequality, maybe it's clear, it's, uh, it's better if you see in this form. So this one is the derivative of the logarithms of h. This one is the derivative of the logarithm of, uh, of r. So what you get and note by the way that I mean it was to have that gamma is positive, it was kind of necessary. This uh, this bound on the that C was less than one over M minus two. So and now integrating that inequality, we get so that h of r is, uh, is less or equal than, than r to the m minus two plus gamma h of one. So which I mean, and now I come back to the old notation. This one means that the energy of F in Br decays like 
R M minus 2 plus gamma the energy in B1. Okay, I was a bit fast in this derivation, but just integrate in R this uh, inequality between, uh, uh, integrate in S between S and 1. Okay? So, and now what I claim is that this one, if, if we just forget for a while that F has values in this multiple points, and we just assume that F is a real value function, from this inequality, we can apply the classical Morey estimates and conclude that, that F is actually older continuous with exponent gamma uh, over 2. This, uh, this, uh, this Mori estimate. So they are, basically they are sometimes called Mori or Mori Campanato estimates. And it's a way to characterize all the continuous function with the properties of, uh, decay properties of integrals. And the Campanato estimate is uh, applying the, the Poincare inequality to this inequality here, which gives you that uh, the integral of BR of F minus the average of F squared. So this one is, uh, is less or equal than R squared, the integral of BR of, of the F squared, which is by this inequality, less or equal than R to the N plus gamma, a constant, which is the integral in B1. And once you have a decay of the, the average integral of f minus its average, this one implies that f is alter continuous. So for classical fun, yeah. The, the gamma. But you don't have the genus, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, it does not depend on the dimension of the of the of the image space. No, not even. In dimension two, it's explicit. It's it's one over q. Exactly. And in neither dimension, you don't have this buff. Mm -hmm. So, in some sense, it, which is, I mean, kind of natural. If, uh, if, if, if we have more values, the situation is, is more degenerate. That's what uh, this exponent 1 over q is saying. Because uh, more the exponent, so smaller is the exponent, worse is the estimate. Okay, but uh, now the only message I want to give out of this, of this derivation is that the proposition gives us a kind of geometric control of, of a trace with, uh, with, uh, with the energy. And that's what, I mean, we are going to see in a while. But then once you have that, you really argue as if the function were real valued. And why can you do this? Because now it's not anymore real valued, but all these quantities are known in terms of composition of Lipschitz function. So we can here put every time a Lipschitz composition, derive the inequality for the Lipschitz composition that we know, and then going back to the function itself. Because all the Lipschitz composition reconstruct the geometry of the metric space. So the only message of this derivation is that in some sense now we have, we have settled all the, all the stuff in a way that, I mean, uh, for most of the computation, we can think to have, uh, to have normal function. Because either we argue via composition, like in this case, and uh, I mean, I invite you as an exercise 
to prove the Mori estimates. For, for q values functions. Or we will see in a while, we will use the pointwise representative of the energy for doing the computation. But in both cases, in some sense, we can uh, in some sense forget to have a multiple values function and just derive differential inequalities or, or equation for which, I mean, we can argue via classical tools. Okay, so if this one is clear now, I will pass to give you some hints for this geometric proposition, why we have this control of the energy with the energy of the trace. Okay, so, and, and just notice this, because it will be useful at some point, that the Lipschitz constant, uh, the older constant of our function will, will depend on this constant here which is the energy in B1. So actually in the theorem, I, I could have written, and I think in the notes it's, uh, it's correctly stated, I could have written uh, an explicit estimate. And the estimate is uh, that the older semi-norm, so, of, uh, of the function f is less or equal than a constant which depends on all the dimensions and then on the set uh, omega prime times the energy in the one. So this one is uh, the explicit estimate one could give about the, the other continuous result. Okay, so now let me now pass to the proposition which has more a geometric content. Hmm? There is a, a, a square root. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so let me pass now to the proposition. So which I remind you, we want it somehow to prove an inequality like this. The energy in the interior is, is less or equal than a constant, which has several bounds, the energy on the boundary. And and this one was just the energy of, of the trace. So I may write the tangential derivative of F squared somehow. Okay, how can we do this? So here the proof is kind of, of deeply different between dimension two and higher dimension. And I will give you just the argument for dimension two, which is very, which is very, very geometric. So I will take M equal to, so we consider here just the case M equal to, which is a, an important restriction in the proof because the proof would change uh, drastically for M bigger than two. And then I assume a mild restriction, which is, I mean, just for convenience, but this one is very simple to generalize. I assume to have two values instead of having a general two values. And I will give the, some hints to the proof in this, in this special case. For m bigger than, than two, there are different tools that you have to exploit, which I mean, we don't see now in this proof I will give you, and they involve some other analytical results about, about the minimizing function, like a, a maximum principle. But this one we, we won't see now. So, in this case, the proof is very geometric, and we may argue like, uh, like this. So we look, first of all, at the boundary, at the boundary data uh, of, of F. And now, since we assume that the 
that f was was actually w12 of the boundary you may show as in the classical and, and that's again a, a point which which goes down to this observation that most of these classical results are kind of easily generalized in this context you may show that actually this f is uh, is continuous so as for one dimension, because this one is a one dimensional space, W12 function are one alpha uh, all their continuous. And that's the same here, because the proof of the embedding works exactly in, in the same way. So since F, F was W12, then actually F is continuous. You may prove all their continuous actually. It's C1 alpha of, of PR. So in some sense now we have a continuous, a continuous um, two cars over the boundary of this, uh, of this, um, of this figure, and actually now two, um, two cases may happen. So you look at these two values curve over the boundary, and what may happen is that either this curve never self intersect or they have some point in common. So now we talk about cars because I mean they are continuous, so we can follow in a continuous way this function. And, and we observe that two cases may occur. And the first one is that we find a point on the boundary which is a double point. So there exists x naught on the boundary such that so f f of, of x naught is equal to two times a point p. So it's a double point. Or all the points at the boundary are are genuinely two values. So these two cases exclude one one the other. So or for every x in the boundary of, of B R, F one of x is different from f2 of x, where f1, f2 is whatever selection for our multiple values function. Okay, and now we treat the, these two cases separately. So this first one is kind of, of easier, because immediately reduces to the, to the classical case. So, So let's, let's make a picture. So this one is our B1 or BR. I mean, actually, without loss of generality, since uh, the estimate is scaling invariant, we can put our, ourselves in the ball B1. And assume now we are looking at, uh, at an S1 here. And we start following our boundary data there. So we start from x0, which is such a double point. And then we follow the first, a first path, a first continuous path above this, up to ending again at this double point in x0. And we call this, and now this one is defining a continuous boundary data, and we call this gamma 1. So this first boundary value is gamma 1, and then starting again from uh, x0, we followed the second path. So this one was a double point, so there was another path going out here. It may intersect again, I mean, this we don't know. Eventually can do or not, but then it comes back again in this double value, which was p there, in this point p above x0. And this one we call gamma 2. So now actually since the boundary data was continuous and we had this double point, we were able to follow kind of continuously these two paths starting from that point. And what we had, we had found a continuous, the composition of our F on the boundary is just given by the deltas on the function gamma one, say, plus the delta on the function gamma two. And this one now is a continuous selection. 
And I told you yesterday, usually we don't have other selection than, uh, than measurable selection. But we have exceptional cases, which are the dimension one and co-dimension one cases. And this one enters in this dimension one case. So when we have multiple values functions on a line, you may find continuous selection if they are continuous. And this one is a very, uh, uh, very basic example of this principle. So now we have uh, the tower boundary data is, uh, is decomposed as the superposition, so the sum in terms of measures. But we, we always talk about, about superposition of two one-valued functions. So now gamma 1 and gamma 2 are just functions from the sphere into a red. And now a way to derive this inequality is, is to exhibit a competitor for F. And the competitor would be the harmonic extension of gamma 1 and gamma 2. So now what I consider is uh, the harmonic extension of, of gamma 1. So, so let's call this zeta 1 of gamma 1 and zeta 2 of, of gamma 2. And then as, as competitor, I take the function h, which is the superposition of, of these two harmonic functions. So it's the deltas in the first function plus the deltas in the second function. And why this one is a good competitor for our f? Because the boundary data is the same. So the boundary data of these two values functions, which now goes from B1 into A2 of Rn, the boundary data is exactly gamma 1, gamma 2, which were the boundary data of F. So F was a minimizer, and we, we may write the F squared less or equal than the H squared by the minimizing property of, of F. But now H is exactly the, the superposition of two single value functions. So it's very simple from the, the formulation of the energy we, we found yesterday to see that the energy is exactly the sum of the two. So this one is exactly the sum from one to two of the energy of this z i squared. And now comes a very simple a very simple computation on, on spherical harmonics that, that says that the energy of um, a, an harmonic is less or equal than, than the integral on the boundary of the, of the tangential derivatives. So this one is, is actually an exercise. So to prove that And I mean, it's very simple if you expand the harmonic function as a, as a sum of um, a, in, in, in Fourier series somehow. That's a way to prove this. So it's less or equal than the integral in B1 of the tangential derivative of Z, which I mean, the boundary value we called, we called gamma. And now, again, F in our boundary was the superposition of the two. So the sum of these two energy is exactly the energy of F. Which is what we wanted to prove in the case R equal one. And that extra factor is coming just from, uh, just from this case. So in the first case, just repeating what I've just done. Having a double point allows us to decompose the boundary data in two curves. Then we have a very natural candidate for a competitor, which is the harmonic extension of these two, two curves. And just comparing with this energy, we get the differential inequality. Okay, now let's see this, this second case, which is genuinely two-valued case. 
So now every value is, uh, is, is different from the other. But nevertheless, the function itself remains continuous because the boundary value is always W12 on the line, which is a continuous function. So now we can argue kind of the same, but we can never decompose this boundary in two, in two curves. But we'll have always a single curve. So the picture here would be, I have this S1 on the base, and then I start from a point here, whatever point, I mean actually I would have two points there. So starting from here, I have kind of a first curve going back here, and then another one which is, uh, which is coming back to the original point. And now always the picture is two-dimensional, but this, this curve here has no self-intersection because we assumed that at the boundary here, we always had two different points. So in, in a two-dimensional representation, I cannot draw this, but you have to imagine that that curve is turning twice on S1. It's a double covering of S1, but has no self-intersection. And now what can we do with this? So in some sense, we can, uh, um, we can find a transformation to, to open this curve, to unroll this curve here. So what we, what we find is, uh, is the following. So, so again, since the boundary data is, is continuous, It's very simple to see that uh, we can find actually a continuous curve. So now gamma from the boundary of, of B1 to Rn such that F on the boundary of, of B1 at a point, uh, uh, let's call this Z as a or let's call this x, uh, is equal to, now let me write the formula and then I will, uh, I will explain what I'm doing. It's the sum on the square root of x of gamma of z. So as, uh, as measures. So what I'm doing is this. So now I have a single curve on S1, which is rolling out twice. And now I, I write a conformal transformation, which is, uh, which is uh, the, the square root of z, uh, in some sense to unroll the basis. So each values here, which is f of x, uh, so this point here is uh, it's x, uh, can be represented by this single curve, which is gamma, which I obtained by, by uh, rolling this, uh, this, uh, this picture here. So now I have here a single gamma. And these two values here, for example, so when I look at these two values here, are the one coming from once the value here and once the opposite. And the only thing I did was opening two eyes via this, this transformation, this, uh, this, uh, this curve. And now once I have such a, a, a representation, here I have again a very, a very natural competitor function for this gamma here, which is the harmonic extension. So now, uh, again, for proving the inequality, I argue by the minimizing property of F, and I show, uh, and I have to cook up a, a competitor. So now as competitor, We consider the, the function h, which at x is just rolling back the harmonic extension of, of gamma. So it's the sum z squared equal x of zeta of z, where zeta is the harmonic extension, the 
harmonic extension of gamma. So now I'm working on this picture here. On this picture, I put the harmonic extension, and then I apply the same transformation going back here. So why this one is a good strategy? So this one is a good strategy because the Dirichlet energy is invariant under conformal transformation. And, and here, this z square is a conformal transformation. So if z was a minimizer for the energy for this picture here, when we roll back, we have still a kind of minimizer for, for this picture here. Because the energy is invariant. And that's what we, we use now. So let me kind of exploit these same lines here. So now what we have is that by minimality, the energy of F is less or equal than the energy of H. But now the energy of H is exactly the energy of, of zeta. And why this? Again, this, was, this one is uh, a, an exercise, which I think in the notes you find also hints for the solution. And that's because the Dirichlet energy is invariant under conformal transformation. So up to here, we have exactly the same, the same conclusion. But now we use the same simple inequality for harmonics. So the energy of an harmonic is controlled by its boundary data. And now here we have to change something. Because now gamma was obtained out of F rolling out twice. So now if you do just a change of variable, you see that you have a factor two in this change of variable here. Because it's a one dimensional integral and you are rolling twice. So here you, you should put A2. But that's again the inequality we wanted. So the energy is less or equal than a constant, it's boundary, it's boundary. And now for dimension two, I told you the constant is kind of, uh, a, it's, it's not important. In higher dimension, it needs to be bigger than one over m minus two. But here could be whatever dimension. And now in the worst case, where you have q values, this one will be q. And that's why in dimension two, we know exactly the, the constant in the, in the older, uh, a, in the other continuity. So this one, in some sense, concludes the proof in this very simple case of, of two-dimensional or two-dimensional surfaces. Now, you may try to do as, as an exercise the Q case, which is just uh, a, an extension of this result to multiple values. The higher dimensional would needs other ideas for proving the, the other continuity in higher dimension. So, do you have a question about this? So if not, I mean, I think it's a good point to stop here, to have a little break. And, and we resume at uh, half past uh, nine with a kind of a new chapter of this, of this theory. See? Let's start again. And now, in some sense, as I told you, we pass to the core of the matter. So we have now the formalism for such functions. We know they are continuous, okay. Now our aim was to analyze the singular set. So from now on, we will spend all our effort to understand how many such points can be somehow in this, uh, in this picture. So let me, in some sense, first of all, let me uh, kind of define formally what is a regular point, what is a singular point, and so on. So now we pass to the analysis of, of singularities. Which is actually what matter in this, 
in this, in this regulated theory for minimal surfaces. And uh, first of all, we need to give a definition, which is for us a singular point and a regular point. So let's start from the regular point. So, so we always assume that u from omega into a q is, is the minimizing. Oh, well, I mean, we don't need. So take a u like this, and then we say that x naught in omega is regular if there exists If there exists R bigger than zero, such that uh, U in, uh, in the ball BR around X naught may be written as a superposition of one of single value function UI with the UI from BR x naught into Rn analytic. So a point is regular. So that's not the end of the definition. But it's regular if in the neighborhood of this point, we may write this function as a superposition of very smooth function. Analytic, I mean, because we are in Rn. If we were on a manifold, they would have, mm, uh, have had the regularity of the manifold but in this case it's, a, it's analytic, and we ask something more. So we ask that, and either such two functions are always, are always different one from the other. So ui of x is different from uj of x for every x in br of x naught, or if they coincide in one point, they need to be the same. Then UI is just coincide with, uh, with UJ. So let me make a picture of this. As yesterday for the points of differentiability. So basically, we are saying that x naught is a regular point if, if our multiple values function looks like this above x naught. So it's just the superposition of very smooth, of very smooth functions. And what may happen is that we count each of these with a different multiplicity. So this one may have multiplicity two, this one may have I don't know, multiplicity five and so on. So this one can happen, but they need to coincide exactly one on the other in this neighborhood. A function like this, so a, a point like this where uh, our function is the superposition of two very smooth functions, so linear function, but they meet on a point, which may be also different from x naught. So such a point is not regular. So this one is a singular point. Because if they meet on a point, they need to coincide. And, and this notion of regularity is the one which adapts very much to the one of, uh, uh, of surfaces. So in principle, if, if, if we look at the graph of these functions as a, as a surface, the fact they intersect is not a good point for a surface because the surface there is not immersed. It's not uh, embedded. So what we are trying to, to reproduce is a notion of, of regular point, a singular point, which then kind of transfer on a geometric way. I mean, of course, in terms of, of parameterization, of, of function, this one would be a very, a very nice function. But nevertheless, if, if we look at the geometric object, this one is for us a singular point. And, um, So, so this one is singular. A branch point 
is also singular. Because here they coincide, but the two functions are not, are not the same. All the points which are not regular are singular by definition. It's not regular. Then it is singular. OK. So I hope, in some sense, I convince you that this notion kind of, of correspond to the geometric one I would like to observe for minimal currents. And actually, the, the theorem we are going to, to prove or to discuss to some extent is a theorem which gives a, a bound on the dimension of this singular point. So this one is the theorem towards whom we are, uh, to which we are um, uh, aimed, which is, uh, so let u now be a deal minimizing, then then the, the outdoor dimension outdoor dimension of the singular set is at most m minus 2. And actually, I mean, we would see is um, is locally finite, but let's say uh, and discrete if in dimension two the result is a bit better. But I mean, we won't see this uh, uh, this part of the theorem. So this one is exactly the analog of. The theorem I stated yesterday by Algren in this special case of, of the parametrization. So the estimate of the singular set is the same, m minus 2, which is what we wanted to prove for minimal currents. And now the only difference is that this singular set now is living in the, in the domain of our parametrization. So now it's an estimate on a set, on a subset of omega, which is the singular set here above which our function is, uh, is, is singular. But I mean, it's very simple. If you imagine that that function is quite flat, the same estimate holds true for the, for the real singular set on the surface. So this one is actually the, the same result for minimum currents in this very special case of parametrization. And now what we try to do in the rest of this course is to understand what are the, the analytical um, the problems and, uh, and issues in this kind of, of result. And, and the road will be quite, quite long and kind of indirect, but it's, a, a, it's, it's anyhow fascinating. So let's, um, let's somehow Once that we have settled our target, let's now kind of start again with, uh, with some preliminaries. And the first preliminaries will be, now you, you will see up to now, we have just used the variational uh, um, um, structure of the problem. So showing, uh, arguing the minimizers and so on. Now for this result, we need, we need also to argue more at the level of the PDs. So the first thing I would like to do is try to write a, a PDE for this, uh, for this uh, function, which I mean, in the context of this, uh, of the calculus of variation, they are called first variation. So Euler-Lagrange equation or, or first variation. Lagrange, a question. 
Okay, for doing this, so first of all, I have to tell you which kind of variation we, we may compute for such objects. We have several which are, which are possible. The two which are more significant are the inner variation and the uh, uh, outer variation. So let's start by the inner variation. So we have u from uh, omega to a q, and then we consider a diffeomorphism from u to u, in, from omega to omega, with a, with a fixed boundary, uh, which is the identity on the boundary. And what we may consider is the composition of u, so the right composition, the internal composition of u with the phi. So we can consider a, a function which we may write u composition phi, which at the point x will be just the superposition of this selection of u computed in the, in the point phi of x. So this one is very natural and, uh, and there's no, no, no conceptual difficulties here. Okay, and let me now give you immediately the outer variation. So for this one, we would like to have a left composition with the, with the U. So what we consider is always u multiple valued. And then we take psi, which is a function from, uh, so, omega times Rn, which is the condemnation of our space. So omega times Rn into another uh, Euclidean space, which most of the case will be Rn itself. So let's, let's take the same. But that I mean you may, you may change. And now what you can do is compose in the left with, the, with C. And now what we get is a function which is, I call big, big C of X and U. And as a function I have to say what is the value in X. But sometimes I will omit this x here because it's already inside such a notation. But it's not, it's not completely, completely rigorous. But save us of writing many x. And now it's the sum of which values. So for every x, I take my c of x at the value ui of x. So for each value ui of, of my function, I consider this external composition on the left, and then I superpose all these values there. And this one is what I called outer variation, which is a way to change the range of the function, which may depend also on the position. Somehow. Okay, now if uh, u is de-minimizing and uh, this these variations are embedded in uh, one parameter family which connects to the identity, I can somehow derive the energy. Being a minimizer, the, the derivative in zero will be, will be zero, and that one is what is giving us the equation. So let me see. If we can simplify a bit this. Okay. So now, now let's consider very, very special variation. So we consider for the internal variation, 
phi of epsilon of x, which is equal to x plus epsilon little phi of, uh, of x, where phi is a compactly supported, we can take smooth vector field of omega into Rm. And you see that for small epsilon, since this one is compactly supported, this C is actually a diffeomorphism, which is the identity on the boundary of, of omega. And what we can take is the derivative at epsilon equal zero of, of the energy of our internal variation, u, u composition with the phi epsilon squared. Now, how to do this computation? And that's again a point of this general philosophy I, I told you at the beginning, that a lot of computation we can do as in a classical setting somehow. Because for this function here, we, we have a kind of, of point-wise representative of, of the gradient. So let me write this here. So one could prove kind of very simple chain rules which says that the, the derivative of u composition phi epsilon, say, squared, is equal to um, so let's let's just write the, the 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 derivative of this multiple values function and this one is just the superposition of the derivative of u at, at this point times the differential of of epsilon and, it, and here you can put the ui. So let me comment on this, on this formula that I mean I don't want to, to prove somehow, but it's, a, it's very elementary, and we will use analogous formula for the other variation. So you know that when you, when you have a Sobolev function, we were able to define the, the differential of the Sobolev function, point-wise almost everywhere was an approximate differential. It was this linear function on Li, which at a certain point we called D of Ui. Now, when you consider such a composition, it's very simple to verify that such differential is, if, if Ui was approximately differentiable at this point, then this one is the, the differential of the composition. And the, and the argument, I mean, it's very simple. You just take the definition of, uh, of differential. You have to verify that uh, it is uh, a, an infinitesimal of the distance. But since every computation was there was, was classical, I mean, you will find out that the same formula is working there. So having such a pointwise representative of the differential gives a very simple way to, to prove this formula here. And now we also showed the equivalence between our energy defined intrinsically via the compositions and the norms of the differential. So here, this norm is exactly the sum of these norms here. So this one is exactly the sum in I of Ui, this point phi epsilon, composition d phi epsilon square. And now here, this one is now a classical computation. So this one is a, a classical differential composition with a, a derivative. And we can take the, the derivative in epsilon in the, in the usual way. And now if you do this computation, which, which is left as, a, as an exercise, you get the usual formula. So this one is the integral in omega, and then you have, uh, so the sum in i of d ui, scalar product d ui in direction d, d phi, 
minus the integral omega of du squared divergence of phi. So it's, it's pointless I do this, this computation at the, the blackboard, but let me give just you an hint how to do by your own. Here you change variables. So since this one is a diffeomorphism, you use phi as a change of diffeomorphism. And when you look at the derivative of the Jacobian, the derivative of the Jacobian is minus divergence of phi. Because it's identity plus epsilon d phi, and the determinant of this matrix is the trace of, of d phi, which is the divergence. So, but I leave this uh, for you. And let me also, also skip another computation. So which kind of formula we get when phi is a, a, radial, a radial function? And again, also at this point, the computation are, everything is done in the usual way. So now when you take phi of x equal, so x, so you have uh, a, a function of the modulus times x. Um, so this formula is, uh, is far too complicated. So let's put this here. And so for, for phi n equal this. And letting phi n going monotonically to the characteristic of the ball br, we get the usual internal variation for a monic function, which is br du squared equal r the integral on br of du squared minus 2r integral on dbr of the normal derivative of u squared. So let me, I mean, I, want, I will skip the computation, but let me just explain what I've, I've written. So now we have a very general formula for these variations, and, and we look at radial variations, so meaning function of the distance to the center times x. And now we let this, this cutoff function tending to, to the identity somehow. When you do this, you obtain the usual equipartition of the energy for a monic function that I'm sure you have seen in uh, any, any calculus course. And maybe you remember very well when in the two-dimensional case. So in the two-dimensional case, this term is zero. And this one is the equipartition between uh, the radial derivative and the normal derivative. Because you know that the total derivative on the boundary is twice the normal derivative. So which means that you have equipartition between radial and normal derivative. Now, in general dimension, you get this extra term here. And here, the formula is really the same. Just use this, uh, this internal variation here. And by the way, I mean, you find, uh, I think, almost all the, the, the details in the notes. Actually, I mean, I think all the details. So this one is for the internal variation. And now let's, let me give you also the formula for the, for the outer variation, if I find it. Uh, yeah. So actually for the outer variation, the derivation is, is, more, uh, is more straightforward. I mean, you don't need to perform this change of variable here. And what you get is the following. So as, as one parameter of variation, you consider phi epsilon of x, and now some, uh, somehow this one should be a big psi of x equal to, um, equal to what? Um, equal to x 
variables. Now here we have two variables. So this is u equal to u plus epsilon little, little c of x u. So this one is a one parameter family which is going to, to the identity. Then I can consider this for a minimizer. So I consider d of this squared integral and I take the derivative in epsilon. And what you get is the integral of the sum over the value of u of dui scalar product the x derivative of c in the point x ui plus the sum in i of dui scalar product the u derivative of c, so with respect to, to the second coordinate, x ui, d ui. Again, do by yourself, I mean, in the notes, uh, you will find anyhow the uh, details. And also, in this case, what happened when we specify our, our, um, So what happens when we, when we specify our vector fields? So it's this. So as a vector field, now we take, so this little phi of x u is just a radial function of, of the position, which will tend to the identity again times u. So in this case, and phi n is going to the characteristic of the ball, what you get is this formula. Integral, so let me write the, the, this formula there. So we save this. So is c of x u, phi n of x times u, and then we get the energy of du is equal to the integral on the boundary of BR of sum on the values of normal derivative of UI, UI. Okay, and again, I mean, I'm not going to prove, uh, to prove this, it's very elementary and pass via this pointwise expansion of the differential. But let me comment again this formula, just to, to remember, you know what I mean? And why this, this formula is so elementary? I mean, if you think uh, uh, at u as a classical harmonic function, this one is just the integration by parts for harmonic function. So one derivative you put on one side, and you, and you have Laplace of u, which is zero, and then you have the boundary data. The boundary data is the normal trace of you know, the normal component of du times u, which is what you what you read here. The normal component of u times u. And now since the computation are done value by value, you get the sum on all the values. So that's nothing uh, exotic there. Okay, and these two formulas are the only two formulas we are going to use next. So this one was kind of big parenthesis without many details on how to, to to derive this Euler Lagrange equation, but in the end we will use exactly these two, these two equations in this integral form somehow. Okay, and now comes one of the of the main point of, of all the theory, which actually is maybe one of the of the most important ideas of Andre to solve this, uh, this problem. And uh, let me do a little, a little premise about this. In all of these, of, of these problems in, in geometrical analysis, uh, usually the starting point, so the, uh, the estimate which is kind of starting the solution of the problem is uh, a monotonicity estimate. So it's an a priori estimate 
on a monotone quantity for the problem. E, which I mean, for example, for minimal currents, I don't know if, if Camillo told you, you have the monotonicity formula for the, uh, for the area ratio of the current. So you take the mass of the current on a ball, you divide by the measure of the, the right dimensional uh, ball with respect to the current, and this quantity is monotone. Now here, for this higher dimension minimal, uh, minimal current, we have a new quantity which is, which is monotone, which was discovered by Amgren, and now goes under uh, the name k feet, which is, uh, so let me remind, this was Amgren called this frequency function. which now you will see it's, a, it's kind of magic quantity already for classical harmonic function, which was never observed before. And the quantity we consider, so we call this E of A, so depending on the, on the radius. And I mean, for the beginning, let me put here also, also a few other symbols. That I mean, I, uh, I will drop starting from the next uh, line. So it depends on the point we are looking and on the function we are considering. And this quantity is defined as uh, a ratio between the energy of the function and, and a norm of the function itself. And the energy, so R is just the right scaling. That's not, not so meaningful. So the energy du squared. And the right norm you have to put here is the L2 norm of the, of the trace. Squared. So it's the integral on BR of U squared. So let me first of all explain you this, this symbol here for, for multiple value function. So it's exactly what you imagine, but just, just to be clear, when I write modulus of U, is the distance of U to the zero point. But the zero point is is, is of course intended as the Q point still. So this one is, uh, is the way we compute this norm. And, uh, and what is this function kind of measuring? So that's always X naught. And these quantities here we will call D for the energy. So the Dirichlet energy and H is called this norm, which is kind of height for the function. And, and, and what is measuring this quantity? It's measuring somehow, so that's very heuristical. I mean, and in the end, all the monotonicity formulas are kind of a miracle. I mean, it's a, there is nothing to explain somehow. It's a, if it works, it works. Otherwise, I mean, you don't know why it works. But somehow, it's, a, it's, a, it's measuring the, uh, in some sense, the degree of disorder of an harmonic function. So it's uh, measuring the energy in terms of, of its norm, or the boundary, but the energy with respect to a norm. And what Amgren found is that if U is harmonic, but actually it's also true in this multiple valued uh, case, if, if U is de-minimizing, then this quantity is, uh, is monotone increasing. Then E of R is monotone increasing. So meaning that for an harmonic function, in some sense, the, um, the average of the energy with respect to its norm, it's, it's decreasing on small scales. scales. And it's, so the kind of disorder of the harmonic function is, uh, is increasing when you go to infinity. That's a very, I know it's a very vague explanation, but it's a, I cannot do better than this. And by the way, this formula was already new for the classical harmonic. And that's kind of the, the surprise of this. Hmm? What's new? Yeah. 
I mean, if, if you try to prove this formula for the classical harmonic function, it's, uh, I don't say it's simple, but it's, a, it's just an integration by parts. But nobody before Algren uh, noticed this. And he noticed this related to this problem here. And let me also spend a few words for another comment. Why it's called frequency? That's a... Hmm? It's bounded also, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Let's say, so let me be a bit more precise uh, in the statement. So it's monotone increasing. Um, so it's monotone increasing if, if you, of course, it's not identically zero, because otherwise it's not even defined. And, and the limit as r goes to zero of e of r is equal alpha is bigger than zero. OK, so let me, uh, so I was saying, a very short comment, why it's called, uh, this one, I mean, will help us to explain the use we will do of this formula, which I mean, I will try to do at the beginning before giving you the computation of the monotonicity. So, so the comment is, why, why frequency? And to answer to this question, just do the computation in the two-dimensional case. So when you have an, an harmonic two-dimensional function, and let's say you have uk, rk, cosinus, uh, k theta, the frequency for this uk is constantly equal k. So the frequency function for uk is constantly k, which is the frequency of this harmonic. And that's uh, where the name is, uh, is coming. If u is a generic harmonic, two-dimensional harmonic, and you take this limit here, then alpha will give you the lowest exponents in the expansion. So if u is equal to the sum of a k r k cosinus k theta, then alpha, which is that limit there, is equal to, so from k0 to infinity, is and that means that k0 is the first one where a k is not 0, so alpha is exactly equal k0. So in the limit, this function is kind of detecting the, the, the lowest frequency of the harmonic. And this one explains a bit the name. So, so let me write this here. In this notation, I mean that a of k0 is not 0. So it's giving the lowest uh, order there. And the point was, uh, so for Amgren, all the uh, kind of the main issue in this, uh, uh, in this problem was, was the following. Was to find somehow a quantity which was saying that uh, the minimal surface is, is not a, uh, it's not an infinite degree um, of contact with the zero with the zero function. So let me say this uh, a bit better, and then I will do the computation. And, uh, and for today we we finish. So that's another comment. So why or the, 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 this formula comes into the into the game, and the point is the following. To analyze these singular points, the strategy will be then to perform a blow-up analysis. So we take this singular point here. We, we focus on small balls here. We arrive to a ball of size one. And we would like to argue f 
for this picture. And why this? Because as all the blobs, um, we will see that the limiting function we get kind of easier. We'll get some symmetries which reduce the complexity of, of the problem. But one of the main issues here in this blow up analysis was in some sense uh, understanding this point, which I mean will come in two kind of key points of the theory. And, and this one is one of these. Understand if the limit here is zero or not. Because when we start from a singular point, we would like to argue that in the limit here, we see a singular point. Because otherwise, this blow up analysis cannot work at all. Because we cannot somehow take any information from the blow up for the original current. So you need, in some sense, to understand that singularities are preserved in the blow up analysis. And what is one phenomenon, one analytical phenomenon for which singularities may not be preserved? If these two leaves of of the current at an infinite order of contact here, so meaning faster than any, any polynomial, then in the limit here you would have seen just twice this flat space here. Because these two leaves are touching with a, an order of contact which is infinite, meaning that any reason to blow up would not separate these two leaves, and the limit will collapse. So the limit will be perfectly smooth and you lose all the information on the, on the singular point. So what is a way to say that a function, that's kind of a problem in a unique continuation theory. Uh, theory. What is a, a way to say that, I mean, uh, an harmonic function is uh, analytic, has not an infinite order of contact, is to detect the lowest frequency in its expansion. And that's what Armgren did. So he found an integral way to detect this lower frequency which was not uh, infinity. This one then we'll, we will use at one point. And this one was able to say that this phenomenon cannot happen. And we will see this uh, Im immediately, I think, next time. How applying this formula, we get that the blow up is not zero, which is one of the main issues he had. So why the blow up is, is not constantly zero in the limit? Because of the monotonicity of the frequency formula. So this formula is controlling the order of contact of the leaves of a minimal surface and say that, I mean, in the limit, they cannot collapse into a single one. So this one is the use we will do of this, uh, of this formula here. So, and now you will see we have 15 minutes, should be enough to prove the formula, because actually it's very elementary. I mean, it's, it's surprising. It's, uh, it's magic, but the proof is very elementary. Okay. So not to miss up too much, let me follow my notes. So we have E, which is Rd over h. D is the energy and h is the bound. Now we'd like to compute the derivative of E and see that the derivative is positive. And why this one suffice? Because I mean, you may verify by yourself that all these quantities are absolutely continuous. So the pointwise derivative coincides with the uh, distribution of derivative. And that's, I mean, allows us to compute pointwise such a derivative here. Now for D, it's very simple. This one was the energy on the ball so the derivative is just the energy on the shell of this ball, almost everywhere. A bit more work we need for h. So to compute h prime of, of r. And for this one, I mean, we make a change of variables. So h was the integral on the boundary of br, and we rescale to the boundary of b1. So we have the area element, and this one was u uh, at the point ry squared dy. And now, by the usual formulas we have given, I mean, we may think of this one like the sum on i of the single selection, and we take the, the derivative pointwise for each one of these. So. So when we derive this, 
we have m minus 1, r to the i, m minus 2, integral b1 of u y r y square b y. So I took the derivative of this, and now I take the, the derivative of the u, so which is uh, the sum i r m minus 1 integral b1 of 2 u i, and then I have the normal derivative in, uh, in y. So scalar normal u i. Now I scale back to sides r. I found that this one is m minus 1 divided by r h itself. And here I have uh, plus the sum on the values, the integral on the boundary of, uh, so twice the normal derivative ui. Which I mean, by the way, we may use this information here, it's, it will be exactly the energy at the center point. Okay, so this one is, uh, so let me, actually, let, let me write this immediately here. So or let me copy the formulas I'm going to use there. Uh, no, let's leave this here. So the, the, this one is m minus 1 divided by r, h of r plus 2 times dr. Okay, you need some effort to see that, I mean, all this computation, which are kind of point-wise, are actually justified rigorously, but so it's not uh, a difficult task. And now we proceed taking the derivative of E, of I. So I prime is equal to D over H plus R D prime over H minus R D H prime over H squared. Okay, and now first of all, we use this formula for H prime. So instead of H prime, I have to put M minus one divided by R H plus twice D prime. A D. This one is a one coming here. Which I mean, if I collect now everything there together, I have uh, two minus m d plus r d prime divided by h minus two r d squared divided by h squared. And now let's use the variation of formula again. So, and let's look explicitly at this formula here. This one is m, 2 minus m, the energy with, with the minus plus r d prime. But r d prime, we computed before, is exactly this, this integral here. Well, I'm, I put sometimes f, sometimes u, is u. So this minus this is actually two times r, this norm here. So this one is two times r integral on the boundary of br of the norm of, of the normal derivative squared divided by h minus two r d squared divided by h. But in place of, 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 um, of d squared, we use now this formula here. So the energy is, is given by this, uh, this double product, and, uh, and we use this information here. So it, this one is the square of the integral on the boundary of the normal derivative times u. And I mean, sometimes when I omit the i here, it means that it's anyhow summed on the on the uh, all values, divided by h squared. So now let's put everything common. We have 2r 
divided by h squared, which multiply h, which I mean we recall is the integral of u squared on the boundary, the integral of br of the normal derivative squared minus this squared here. So minus the integral of the boundary of u d nu u squared. And you see now by Cauchy's part that this quantity is positive. So this one is the scalar product between u d u squared. This one is the product of the integral of u squared d nu squared. So by Cauchy's part, this quantity is positive. And that's the end of of the proof of the monotonicity. So maybe I was a bit fast, but there are all elementary computations somehow. Once you, you realize that you may justify all, uh, all these computations, value by value. And actually, I invite you to do as an exercise the same computation for the classical harmonic functions, because they're very extractive and you realize what is the point there. So before concluding, let me also make one step further in this, uh, now looking at this proof. So it's a good reason not to postpone to tomorrow. Now looking at this proof, let's see when we have the case of, of equality here. So when E prime is, uh, is zero. Let's a corollary, which says that E of R is constantly its values alpha, if and only if U of X was actually homogeneous of degree alpha. So meaning that U of X is equal X to the alpha U X over modulus of X. So, in, and here it's what I mean, I was saying that in the limit, we will simplify our, uh, our problem. Because the limit will be homogeneous, meaning it will have a degree less of freedom somehow. But that's what we will see tomorrow in more details. But then in, uh, the analytical estimate is this. So, E prime is constant if and only if this quantity is zero almost everywhere. And when, uh, in the Cauchy's part, you have uh, equality. You have equality when uh, um, the two vectors are proportional. So for almost every R, if and only if for almost every R bigger than zero, we have that U restricted to the ball BR to the boundary of the ball BR is equal to a constant, which in principle may depend on R, the normal derivative of U. So that's the only, the only possibility to have, uh, to have there the, the equality. Now, as a first step, let's understand what is this, uh, this constant here. And for doing this, let's compute the frequency once again, using a, a different formula. So alpha, which is the value of the frequency, which I told you it's R, the energy, divided by uh, H of R. But now you use the, equipart you use the integration by part formula, which was the external variation for the energy, which is saying that the energy was, was actually the integral on the boundary of u d nu u. This one was exactly the integral of u squared on the boundary. And now these two are proportional. So this quantity here is, is uh, exactly r, r lambda r. So this one gives us a formula for lambda. So actually what we have is that u the boundary of BR is equal to alpha divided by R, the normal derivative. 
And now here you have, again, kind of little technicalities. So you, you would like now to integrate this, uh, this equation radially. And this one, I mean, you may do for every values because the radius is one dimensional and you have this, uh, this, this continuous selection for one dimensional uh, stuff. And now you see that this one happens if and only if you is exactly homogeneous of, uh, of degree alpha. Okay, just integrating on the, on the radii this, uh, this equality there. Modulus, few technicalities, because this one has to be done for almost every radii, and you have to distinguish the values one to the other. But here it's, uh, in the notes, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, explained. So you find the details there. So with this, we, we close, but let me just, just recall what we did today. So apart from the continuity, we started studying the singular behaviors of the minima surface. And as I told you, it's kind of uh, a very long road, which uh, will lead us to that uh, point. And one of the main points is this. So to have an a priori estimate, which is saying that if, if we, we perform our blow-up analysis, we don't, don't lose a track of singularities because everything becomes zero. And the way to say this is an a priori estimate, which comes from this magic Montonicity formula, which is saying that the, uh, the, this quantity is monotone. So it's, it's defining a limit. And, and you will see that the only fact that this quantity is monotone implies that it's bounded. The only fact that it is bounded will tell us that the limit cannot be zero. So, so the information, the first information we will use of, out of this formula is that the frequency of R always less or equal than a constant implies the blow up are not zero. So that's the way we will make use of this formula. Let me also, also comment, so this one is a very special case because we changed the energy and we worked with a minimizer of this uh, harmonic energy, which is kind of the linearized equation. What happens if we consider the, the real equation? So the, the mass uh, for an integral current. What we get is not a, a, such a clean monotonicity, but an almost monotonicity. So for currents, the estimate here change, but the base of the computation is this, anyhow. The only point is that we have extra errors and the estimate reads like this. So for minimizing current, we have a monotonicity which says for every R less than S, E of R is less or equal than a constant, E of S plus a, a constant. So that's uh, how the how the estimate will change. But this one will be still in, in, enough to say that we are bounded once we know that at, at the initial value the frequency was bounded, and boundness implies the blow up is not trivial. But this one we will see tomorrow with uh, hopefully with the end of the story. Okay, so I will stop here. And I uh, ask first if you have questions about, about what we have seen uh, today.